Um, so today we'll be finishing up some of the things that we didn't have time to cover last time on optimization-based meta learning, and then we'll also be covering non-parametric approaches to few shot learning. Uh, before we get started with the technical content, a few uh, reminders. So homework one is due on Wednesday, and homework two is coming out this Wednesday. Homework two will include both. Uh, you will both implement Mammal uh, as we just uh, as we covered last week, and you'll also be implementing prototypical networks, which is a uh, non-parametric approach to few shot learning, which we'll cover today. I um, posted uh, a form for you to fill out on the poster preferences. Uh, this is the preferences for the date of the poster session. Please fill this out. I think that last time we checked, only like five people had filled it out. Uh, we're trying to schedule a venue for the poster session now, and the, we have a better venue that's booked for Tuesday the 3rd, but we want to make sure that people are uh, available that day um, because it's not during the normal course session time. So please fill out that form. Um, we also posted details on the course project and instructions, uh, including instructions for the proposal, the milestone, and the final uh, project and poster session. Uh, so please take a look at that. We also posted some suggestions that were from the broader AI community on Piazza. Uh, and the proposal, which is the first part of the project, is due on Monday, uh, October 28th. But we encourage you to get started early and to find um, to either figure out what you want to do before that alone or to find a group to work with. OK, um, so the plan for today, uh, first we'll cover optimization-based meta learning, basically recap what we covered last week very briefly, and then discuss some more advanced topics. Uh, and then we'll cover non-parametric few-shot learning. Uh, this will probably be the bulk of the lecture. Um, and this will include things like Siamese networks, matching networks, and prototypical networks, as well as some other hybrid approaches. Uh, and then lastly, we'll be covering properties of meta-learning algorithms and basically how we can think about comparing the classes of approaches that we've seen so far uh, and the types of things that we might want when developing new meta-learning algorithms. OK, so that's kind of a, a summary of what we'll go over today. Uh, so first, let's recap from last time. So we talked about how fine-tuning is a very effective way for uh, leveraging information from previous data sets uh, by pre-training the parameters on those data sets and then fine-tuning by running gradient descent uh, or, or your favorite optimizer to reuse those features that were learned uh, for learning on your new data set. Uh, and then we talked about, well, uh, can we think about how we might go about the pre-training process in a principled way, especially if we want to be able to fine-tune with very small amounts of data at test time. Uh, and then we talked about one way to do that. So one way to do that is basically by trying to embed this fine-tuning procedure into uh, the meta-learning process by taking this fine-tuning procedure, evaluating how well the resulting fine-tuned parameters do well on held-out data, uh, and then essentially optimizing this objective with respect to a set of pre-trained parameters across a wide range of tasks. Okay, um, so kind of uh, this was the, the model agnostic meta-learning algorithm that we discussed, uh, and this optimizes for an effective initialization for fine-tuning. Uh, we also discussed how the, well this performs on extrapolated tasks, and we found that it works uh, quite well in comparison to the black box adaptation approaches. Uh, and we also looked at the expressive power and showed that uh, the expressive power of these models, of these algorithms, um, is quite substantial if you have a deep enough neural network um, and, and kind of requires a bit, more, um, a bit more expressive power in the architecture in comparison to black box approaches. OK, um, so now uh, I'd like to talk a bit about some other properties of these kinds of algorithms and different ways that we could extend the algorithm um, to address various challenges. So uh, first, uh, one, one thing that we had talked about actually towards the beginning is how you can view uh, metaparameters theta as serving as a prior for task-specific adaptation, where kind of this prior is encapsulating the um, is encapsulating the knowledge in your meta-training data set. So can we make this more formal? So it turns out we can actually uh, make a bit of a deeper connection than just saying that it's going to form, it's kind of, kind of form this loose prior as an initialization for fine-tuning. Uh, in particular, to see this, let's look at uh, the following graphical model. Uh, so theta is representing um, our, our meta-parameters, and phi i is denoting the task-specific parameters, uh, the, the parameters for each task. And then the shaded circle is representing the data points that we have for each task. And it's shaded because we can observe those during the meta-training process. Um, now, uh, if you think about how, um, 
how you might go about uh, doing inference in this graphical model. Uh, we assume that we have uh, this data set. We want to maximize the likelihood of our data set given our metaparameters. Uh, this is essentially how you would go about doing inference in this graphical model with respect to the meta-learn parameters. Okay, um, and you can also write this out as kind of a sum of log likelihoods as well. Uh, and then from there, we can introduce this second, introduce our task specific parameters phi i. Uh, these are going to be, these are integrated out uh, because we're trying to optimize over our meta parameters theta. Um, and so, hence, we're just expanding this expression uh, for p date. P, probability of the data given the meta parameters into probability of the data given the task specific parameters and the probability of the task specific parameters given theta, uh, where that second term is representing the prior that theta is enforcing or imposing on our task specific parameters. Um, this corresponds to uh, empirical Bayes uh, approaches to for like optimizing the hierarchical Bayesian model. Um, so now from here, uh, this this integral over all possible task specific parameters is is intractable, particularly when we have large numbers of parameters, right? So we don't really have a good way to think about performing this optimization in any exact way. Uh, and so what we can do is we can say, well, let's fairly crudely approximate this integral with um, a point estimate for phi i, which is going to represent the maximum a posteriori estimate of those parameters. Um, this is a, of course, a, a crude approximation, but it is something that will at least uh, the map estimate is a better choice uh, for these parameters than other choices because it has the maximal probability, of course. Um, now the question comes in, well, okay, if we're going to make this approximation to try to, uh, to represent our objective at the top, um, how do we compute the map estimate? Uh, well, it turns out that uh, it, under specific conditions, gradient descent with early stopping uh, corresponds to map inference with under a Gaussian prior with mean at the initial parameters and a variance that is uh, determined by the number of gradient steps and the step size. Uh, and this is exact in the linear case and approximate in the nonlinear case. And so what this means is that if we're doing uh, kind of getting the map estimate by running gradient descent with early stopping, that it corresponds to the inner loop of the mammal objective. Uh, and you can then loosely view mammal as approximating hierarchical Bayesian inference in this graphical model. Uh, of course, this involves several approximations, one approximation that is using the map estimate and another approximation which is thinking about gradient descent with early stopping as map inference in the nonlinear case with neural networks. Um, but I think that this kind of interpretation is helpful for getting some intuition for what these kinds of approaches are doing. Yeah? What is the stopping criteria? Uh, for, for early stopping? So in the case of mammal, we just pick a, a certain number of gradient steps. We pick one gradient step or five gradient steps. Um, and the particular, the variance of this Gaussian prior is determined by the number of gradient steps that you use and the step size that you use for those gradient steps. So I guess unlike typical neural network training, we're just kind of picking, uh, picking the number of gradient steps rather than choosing a stopping criterion based off of validation error, for example. Um, so you can essentially view like the initialization of these parameters as serving as an actual explicit prior in a Bayesian model. Okay. So you can view uh, this form of initialization with a few gradient steps as one form of implicit prior on the uh, on the task specific parameters, and there are other ways to think about priors that we could impose on the optimization process. Um, so for example. One thing we could do is instead of having this implicit prior that's imposed by only doing a, few, a small number of gradient steps, we could have an explicit Gaussian prior uh, where we are uh, actually regularizing the inner optimization to be close to our meta parameters theta. And so this would correspond to an explicit Gaussian prior uh, with mean theta and a variance that uh, is a function of, of lambda. Um, so this is basically the form of uh, like the log likelihood of a Gaussian. Um, another form of prior that we could do is we could be even more, uh, even more uh, explicit and actually try to represent, um, do basically a form of Bayesian linear regression on top of learned features and represent um, the mean invariance of that, uh, represent the mean invariance of, of that Bayesian linear regression as meta parameters themselves. 
Um, so these are kind of two forms of, of, uh, of gradient-based meta-learning algorithms that have tried to place explicit uh, priors on it. Um, another uh, class of methods have looked at uh, just having the prior be imposed based off of the feature space in which you're learning on. So kind of similar to this last approach where they're doing Bayesian linear regression on the last layer, there are also a number of approaches that have done an optimization on top of learned features, uh, such as performing ridge regression or logistic regression on top of learned features in the inner loop, uh, as well as uh, a support vector machine uh, on those learned features. Um, so essentially these, different, these corresponds to different inner loops of the meta-optimization algorithm, and then the meta-training process involves differentiating through these inner loops uh, by either treating them as a closed form optimization, as a convex optimization problem that you can differentiate through, um, or, or other optimizations. Okay, um, in this last approach, uh, I, this may be out of date now, uh, but as of a few months ago, it was a state of the art um, on few shot class, image classification benchmarks. Although to do that, they introduced a number of bells and whistles in order to get it to um, kind of reach that. It wasn't just the, the, the approach itself. Uh, in many ways, those, those bells and whistles are often important for getting, um, getting state-of-the-art performance on, on benchmarks. Okay. Cool. So now let's go over a few of the challenges that come up with these types of approaches. So... Uh, one challenge is that we, we just talked about how MAML, you may need much deeper networks in order to be able to effectively uh, get an expressive gradient update that can represent a number of different uh, update rules to your parameters. And so how do we think about choosing the architecture for, that is effective for MAML-like algorithms? Uh, and so one idea for this is uh, there was a paper that looked at, can we do a neural architecture search on the MAML architecture uh, such that meta-learning works well? Uh, they were called this auto-meta in the sense that you're doing both auto-ML and meta-learning. Uh, and one of the things that was interesting about this paper is that they found that highly non-standard architectures were actually effective for MAML um, in contrast to their effectiveness for, um, for kind of standard supervised learning problems. So for example, they found that deep and narrow architectures tend to work well. Um, and these were kind of different from the architectures that work well in standard supervised learning. Uh, and so for example, um, if you take uh, mini ImageNet with the basic architecture uh, that reaches around 63% performance, uh, MAML with this kind of optimized architecture uh, saw an 11% absolute improvement in performance, which is pretty substantial. Yeah. Do you know actually what the were? Like specifically what the changes were? Um, it involved, it was a fairly complex architecture as, as me, what many of these architecture search things give you. Uh, it was much deeper, uh, maybe like two or three orders of magnitude deeper. And, uh, and from what I remember, it was also narrower. They also had some operations that were a bit non-standard in neural networks. Um, something like one by one convolutions or something like that, but it's been a while since I, I've read the paper. Okay. Um, so another challenge that comes up is that you have this bi-level optimization procedure that we need to perform in order to perform meta-learning. And this can exhibit some instabilities, particularly if you don't have uh, as, as, as much expressive power that you'd like in your current architecture. And there have been a few different ideas for trying to mitigate this. So um, one approach was to try to automatically learn the inner learning rate of the... Um, of the algorithm, basically learn that alpha parameter that was in those equations. Uh, and specifically, one of the things that these papers have found to work, to be particularly important here, is to learn uh, an inner learning rate that, course, that is different for each parameter or different for each, um, for each layer of the network. And this is because things like biases and weights may want to have different learning rates. Biases may want to have larger learning rates. Weights might, may, may want to have smaller learning rates. And you want, them to, you want to be able to decouple uh, kind of those those different choices for those different layers such that they don't uh, have a sort of conflicting optimization. Um, and then there's also an approach that tried to tune the outer learning rate as well. Uh, there are approaches that try to optimize only a subset of the parameters in the inner loop, um, such as like some of the parameters that are uh, like affine transformations on each of the layers. Uh, there are papers that have looked at decoupling the inner learning rate, uh, kind of as I mentioned before, as well as the batch norm statistics per gradient step, such that you have a different learning rate for each gradient step or a different learning rate or, or a different set of batch form statistics for each gradient step as well. Um, and then lastly, there are also some papers that have introduced context variables 
for uh, increased expressive power that basically introduce variables that, um, additional variables into the neural network that are appended onto the activations at each layer uh, and allow the gradient steps to store information in those parameters uh, in a way that doesn't interfere with the other parts of the network computation. Um, so for me, the kind of the main takeaway from these papers uh, that, that I think would be helpful for you is that there's a range of simple tricks that can help the meta optimization process significantly. Are there any questions on these challenges before I move on to the next set? Okay. Um, so one more challenge that I'd like to go into a bit more depth on is that backpropagating through many inner gradient steps is going to be very compute intensive and very memory intensive. So if you, uh, if you have one inner gradient step or a few inner gradient steps, it's generally quite practical to think about how you might backpropagate through only a couple of those. But if you have an extended optimization process in the inner loop, then it's very challenging to think about how you'd actually backpropagate through that in a way that doesn't require storing the entire optimization process in memory and doesn't require backpropagating, um, ideally doesn't require backpropagating across um, through that entire, uh, that optimization process. Um, so there are two approaches that have been kind of proposed for dealing with this. Uh, the first is a very crude approach for dealing with it, which is just to approximate the Jacobian of the task specific parameters phi i with respect to the uh, meta parameters theta as the identity. Uh, this is a very crude approximation and it basically corresponds to uh, kind of truncated backpropagation in some regard where you just take the gradient at the, those last parameters and copy it over to theta. Um, somewhat surprisingly, this actually works pretty well on a number of simple few shot learning problems like mini image net, like Omniglot that we've discussed in this class. Uh, but anecdotally, from what I found, it doesn't work um, in more complex meta-learning problems, such as in meta-imitation learning problems. Um, but it's something that's, uh, that's probably worth trying if you have uh, a setting where you uh, are compute-bound or memory-bound. Um, it's also, I think, aesthetically not as pleasing because it's a bit of a hack in some regard. Like, we know that this, this matrix is not actually close to identity. Um, and then, so I guess one way to think about this is can we try to compute the metagradient without differentiating through this optimization process and in a way that doesn't approximate this optimization process as identity. Um, and this is where I want to go to the whiteboard to kind of discuss how we might try to do this. So um, as you remember, I guess, from last time, if you write down the, um, the metagradient, you get a form that looks like a single backward pass at your uh, at your task specific parameters. And then you have a term that basically is differentiating through the update rule. So if you have, uh, you basically need to be able to compute D of U uh, of theta with respect to your parameters theta. Um, and this requires storing all of the iterates of this update rule. Uh, if you try to do it kind of with standard backpropagation approaches. And so what we'd like to be able to do is compute this derivative without differentiating through this, the, the entire optimization path that got you there. Um, so the first thing that's worth noting is we're going to have to compute this update, th th this forward process of the update rule no matter what. Um, so we're still going to at least have one full forward pass through that update rule. Um, but there are things that we can do to try to mitigate the metagradient optimization. Um, so to write, First, let's um, kind of write down what this update rule looks like. Uh, and in particular, we're going to use the update rule that corresponds, that has an explicit Gaussian prior on the, um, on the parameters. And we'll see why this matters in a second. So let's say that uh, phi is equal to the output of our update procedure. And this update procedure uh, takes as input a set of training data points. Um, and let's say that this is equal to uh, the solution to some optimization problem on the parameters with respect to our training data set. Uh, and then also with respect to explicit Gaussian regularization that tries to keep our task parameters close to the parameters theta. So this is just a Gaussian regularization with mean theta uh, and variance that's a function of, um, of lambda. 
Um, note here, in, in this case, we're going to be looking at an, an inner optimization that is actually two convergence. Uh, that's trying to actually take the full argmin rather than just running one or a few steps of gradient descent. Um, and if we're going to be doing that, then actually having this regularization term is really important because uh, if we ignored this term and just initialized it at theta, then and actually found the minimum of this function, uh, that minimum wouldn't actually be a function of theta. Uh, if it's not a function of theta, then we don't actually we aren't actually imposing any prior on that inner optimization process. And so this is what that's what the role of this um, what this regularization is doing. It's basically imposing this prior on the inner optimization. Okay, so let's refer to this function right here as g of phi prime and theta. Phi prime is just, phi prime is just our optimization variable, um, and if we actually find the argmin of this um, of this function, then we know that the gradient of g with respect to phi prime is equal to zero uh, because we found kind of the, the local optimum, right? Uh, and so what we can write is that we can write down that if this is equal to zero, then we know that the um, gradient with respect to um, and sorry, actually, this is evaluated at phi prime equals phi. So if we know this, then we know that the gradient of the first loss term, I'm going to start dropping the D-train for, for notational convenience. We know that the gradient of the first term plus the gradient of the second term, which is just lambda times phi minus theta, is equal to zero. So this is just plugging in uh, the gradient of G. And then from there, we can rearrange terms a bit. So, um, so let's bring phi on the left-hand side of the equation. And then we can write out that this is equal to um, theta minus 1 over lambda times the gradient of phi L of phi. So here we're just rearranging the terms from this bottom equation, or from this, this equation right here. And then if we differentiate this with respect to theta, because we're trying to ultimately get d phi d theta up there, we get that d phi d theta is equal to the identity, which is just the derivative of that, minus 1 over lambda times the derivative of the outside, which is uh, the Hessian at phi times the chain rule d phi d theta. Okay, and so interestingly what we can do here is we can uh, arrange the terms a little bit and try to solve for d phi d theta. Uh, and the result of that is going to be something that actually doesn't depend on the optimization path and only depends on the final point of that optimization. Uh, so in particular what we can do is we can arrange um, try to put, well, let's put i on, on one side on its own. We get, um, if we move this over to the left, we get uh, the identity minus 1 over lambda L of phi. All of this times d phi d theta equals identity. So this is just moving this term over to the right. And then what we get is that we get d phi d theta equals basically the inverse of this term. Okay, so one of the nice things about this is, well, this is exactly what we wanted to get, and this only depends on the Hessian at the final optimization point. And so that means that this is actually something that we can compute without actually differentiating through that inner optimization process, um, which is quite nice. Uh, and I guess the, the assumptions that we made to get there is that, the, that basically that this inner solve is accurate, that it gets to a point where the gradient is zero, um, and that we, of course, can compute this. Uh, and there are ways that we can try to estimate this uh, by uh, using 
conjugate, the conjugate gradient algorithm, which tries to estimate basically this, these Hessian vector products. Of course, this is just this is just uh, something that looks like a Hessian. And then the um, the actual gradient that we'll be performing is the gradient that we derived from last time that corresponds to the uh, the back propagated vector at that optimization point times this term right here. Yeah. Yeah, so the, there are, kind of as I was mentioning, you can use conjugate gradient algorithms to try to estimate this inverted matrix term. Um, and basically the number of iterations that you run of conjugate gradient, the more accurate your estimate of this term will be. Uh, and at convergence it will be, or at, if you run kind of it for, for uh, infinite number of iterations, you'll get an exact estimate, of, or you'll get, uh, you'll approach an exact estimate of this. Um, if you do zero iterations of conjugate gradient, you actually just estimate this as the identity, which is actually just exactly the, um, which is exactly the, the kind of first order mammal algorithm that's written up there. Okay, so what does this give us? Um, so this used what's called the implicit function theorem, um, which is a way to kind of think about how to differentiate functions implicitly. Uh, to get these, uh, to get kind of this form of the gradient. Uh, and so you can look at this algorithm, one of the nice things that you get is that uh, particularly it's very memory uh, efficient. So you don't have to store that optimization process. And then computationally, as you um, increase the number of conjugate gradient steps, you'll, it'll become more compute intensive. Um, and that it allows you to basically trade off how accurate you want the metagradient to be with how much compute you want to spend. Uh, and so in particular what these plots are showing, the first is showing the GPU memory on a, a, a very simple, um, a very simple meta learning algorithm. And as we see, the kind of, if we change the number of inner gradient steps, uh, both first order mammal shown in purple and uh, implicit mammal as this algorithm is called, uh, shown in green are constant in memory as you increase the number of gradient steps because uh, they don't actually do anything to store those, um, to store the, the optimization procedure, whereas the full mammal, grade, uh, mammal algorithm increases linearly in memory as you have to increase the number of inner gradient Perfect. steps. Yeah. Since we derived this using the argument, um, does that imply that we want more inner gradient steps to get sort of a more accurate, like so that this gradient yeah, so in practice, you would want more inner gradient steps, or I guess in theory, you would want more inner gradient steps in order to uh, try to have this, this be more accurate. Uh, in practice, we found that the algorithm doesn't need, uh, like you can still run the algorithm in practice with, um, with, without that condition being true and getting uh, gradients that are reasonably accurate. Um, and then the second plot is showing computation time. Uh, and so you can see that for different, numbers of conjugate gradient steps shown in green, gray, and red, we see an increase in the amount of computation. Um, and then uh, with MAML, because you're computing, you're basically computing the, the full gradient, uh, you don't have an effective way to trade off how much computation you want uh, as a function of the accuracy of the meta gradient. Okay, so, and then I guess the other uh, benefit of this approach is that it means that you can use second order optimizers in the inner loop. Uh, you can use really, uh, you can also include like basically non-differentiable optimizers in the inner loop because this really just uh, depends on the, the final term and not actually the optimization process itself being differentiable. Uh, and so for example, we used a Hessian free optimization approach um, in combination with this algorithm and we're able to outperform methods that use um, just like gradient descent based uh, inner optimizers. Okay, um, and then the last thing worth mentioning about this algorithm that is that it's a very recent development, and so the, all the typ typical caveats with recent work apply, and that not a lot of people have tried to um, kind of play around with this approach and fully uh, test its, its, um, its capabilities and its limitations. Okay, any questions on this before moving on? Okay, um, so the, I guess the, the takeaway for optimization-based methods is that uh, you 
do them by, by constructing an, a bi-level optimization procedure where the inner optimization is something like gradient descent, like SVMs, uh, like Hessian free optimization procedures, uh, and then differentiate or, or uh, either differentiate through that optimization procedure or do something like we did here in order to compute the meta gradients. Um, the benefits of this type of approach is that you get a positive inductive bias at the start of meta-learning because you already have this optimization procedure in the loop uh, and you can already expect it to do something reasonable at initialization time. Uh, in contrast to black box approaches where the initial optimization procedure is just some neural network. Another takeaway or a kind of positive note about uh, these, these procedures is that they're consistent uh, and that they, the procedure that you run at test time corresponds to an actual optimization method. Uh, and as a result, you can tend to extrapolate better to learning problems that are outside of the distribution of what you've seen during meta training. And we'll get back to this point a little bit more at the very end of the lecture. Uh, and they're also maximally expressive if you have a, uh, a very deep neural network. Oh, and the last thing is uh, it's model agnostic, so it's pretty easy to combine with different model architectures. Uh, now, in terms of limitations, this requires typically a second order optimization, um, either by differentiating through that, that optimization or by doing something like this, where you still have second order terms that pop up. And as a result, it's usually pretty compute or memory intensive. Okay, so now that we've talked about kind of embedding gradient based optimization procedures into the inner loop, one question you might ask is, can we embed some other learning procedures into the meta-learning process without requiring a second order optimization? Uh, and this is kind of where non-parametric methods are going to fit in. Uh, so in particular, we, what we've been thinking about is how we can learn parametric models. And there's this whole other class of machine learning methods, uh, non-parametric methods, namely, uh, that are simple and work very well in low data regimes. Um, these are things like uh, nearest neighbors, for example. If you have a small amount of data, these methods are actually quite effective um, at learning. And during meta test time, few shot learning is exactly, precisely in the low data regime. Uh, and so these non-parametric methods are likely to perform pretty well. Uh, but of course, during meta training, we still want to be parametric because we want to be able to scale to large data sets. And so the kind of key idea of these types of approaches is can we use parametric meta learners to produce effective non-parametric learners? Um, great, so, and I guess one other kind of side note here is that a lot of these non-parametric methods um, preceded some of the parametric approaches that I've been talking about, but for the sake of this kind of, this lecture, we'll be presenting them afterwards. Okay, um, so the key idea here is to use some sort of non-parametric learner. Um, and one kind of non-parametric learner is to think about doing nearest neighbors. So if you want to be able to perform this few shot learning problem, one very natural approach that actually may have, someone may have mentioned this earlier in the course is to think about, well, why don't we, how would we just like take this test data point and compare it to all the training data, data points uh, and look at each of these training data points and find the one that looks the most similar and then return the one, return the label corresponding to the one that looks the most similar. Um, basically compare the test image with your training images. Uh, now the kind of the key question that comes up is how do you compare them? With what metric do you compare your test image to your training image? Uh, and if you weren't using something like meta-learning, uh, what you might do with these types of methods is use something like uh, L2 distance between your data points. Uh, unfortunately with images, L2 distance is, uh, works very poorly. Uh, so one really nice example of this is if you take uh, this query image on the right and compare it with the two images on the left, uh, L2 distance is going to return the image on the left. Uh, and this doesn't, doesn't, very good, doesn't correspond well with uh, kind of perceptual distances and more semantic distances between images. And so the key idea of these methods is instead of comparing in the space of your observations, can you learn how to compare using your meta-training data in a way that is effective for new tasks. Okay, so um, I guess the, the kind of the first type of approach that we might imagine doing here uh, was uh, proposed uh, by Koch in 2015. 
And what they did is they trained a Siamese network to predict whether or not two images are of the same class. So you're essentially just learning to compare pairs of images and saying whether or not they're the same class or not. Uh, and so what this could do is it could learn a more semantic uh, distance between two images. And so you could take these two images. We know that in our Mediterranean data set, these are of different classes. So the label for this Siamese neural network would be zero. Uh, for this pair of images, these are two, uh, two images that are from the same semantic class, and so the, this would correspond to one. Um, and you repeat this for different pairs of images in your meta-training data set, asking the neural network to predict whether or not they're from the same class or not. Okay. So at meta-training time, we're doing these pairwise comparisons, and then if we want to be able to do few shot classification at meta-test time, what we do is we compare each image x test to each of your images in your training data set for that task, basically just like we mentioned a few slides ago. Uh, and then you output the label corresponding to the closest image. So if your classifier, for example, outputs a probability of 0.9 for the third image and a, a probability of 0.2 for the second image uh, and something lower than 0.9 for all the others, then you'd output the one that has the highest, uh, highest likelihood prediction corresponding to your um, corresponding to the label of that, uh, of that image. So that the output the label that, has, that, is, that corresponds to the image with the highest likelihood of matching your test image. Okay, so this is pretty nice. It's also really simple. Uh, and what we're doing is at, at, during meta training time, we're training this binary classifier. And then at meta test time, we're performing an n-way classification by doing the, each of these pairwise comparisons. Now, one thing you might ask is, well, okay, we, we talked a lot about meta-training and meta-testing and trying to match what happens at meta-training and meta-testing. Uh, and here, we're not, mat like these are, these are different procedures, right? Uh, we're not actually training it to do n-way classification, we're training it to do something else. We're training it to do binary classification. So is there a way that we can try to match what happens during meta-training and what happens during meta-testing? such that we're training it to be able to be good at n-way classification rather than training it to be good at binary classification. So this was kind of the, the key idea introduced in uh, the Matching Networks paper. And in particular, if we were gonna be doing nearest neighbors at test time in order to match our test query image to each of our training data points, how about we train an embedding space such that nearest neighbors produces accurate predictions. Um, so here's an example of what this looks like. So we take each of the images in our training data set, we embed them uh, into a learned embedding space. We then take our test query image and also embed that into an embedding space. And we compare each of, uh, each of these embeddings to make a prediction. So uh, each of these black dots here will correspond to a comparison between the, uh, the the test embedding and the training embeddings. And then we'll take the label corresponding to each of our training images and our prediction will correspond to the weighted uh, nearest neighbors, basically the, the weighted uh, labels of each of the training images or the training labels weighted by their similarity score. All right, and then um, I guess once you do this, you can then train your neural network end-to-end -end in order to make effective predictions on your <laughs> test data points. So the particular architecture they use in this paper was they use a convolutional encoder uh, to kind of embed the images, and they also use this bidirectional LSTM to produce the embeddings of each of the, the training data points, although in practice you could choose, some, you could choose simpler things for, these, uh, for each of these models. Um, and as I mentioned, the model is trained end-to-end, -end, uh, and most critically, here meta-training is matching what's happening at meta-testing. So during meta-training, you're training it to make comparisons to all the images in your training data set, and at meta-test time, you're doing the same thing, making predictions uh, for each of the, uh, for the n-way classification problem that you're going to be doing. Yeah? What was their motivation for using an LSTM? Um, so in this case, I think that their motivation here was such that the, basically information about two different classes can be spread to, to one another, basically. Like if you're trying to be um, classifying between uh, four different types of dogs, for example, versus between a dog and a cat, uh, the way that you represent your embedding 
might be different. For example, if you're trying to classify between dogs and cats, your embedding space, your embedding of a dog should represent uh, something that is uh, something that is, is kind of general to all types of dogs, whereas if you're trying to do a more fine-grained classification of classifying between two types of dogs, then you want that embedding space to be more discriminative based on the type of dog. Yeah? Right, so with because of the LSTM, it does actually impose an order for this for this particular architecture. In practice, the um, there, and there are other, there are other non-parametric methods that aren't order dependent, and the next method that we'll talk about is not order dependent. Um, I think that for this particular paper, they chose the order arbitrarily. Okay. So how do we go about actually training this? Uh, so the general algorithm looks basically the same as the algorithms that we're taking, that we're looking at before. So if we take the, the algorithm corresponding to the amortized, or corresponding to the black box approach, um, if we want to think about how we do this for matching networks, we first sample a batch of tasks. We sample a trained data set and a test data set for each of those tasks. We then compute predictions uh, using this learned similarity metric. Uh, and note here that unlike the parametric methods, we don't have these parameters phi. They're essentially integrated out uh, into this comparison, and hence it's a non-parametric non approach. Uh, and then once we have these predictions, then we update our, the parameters of this learned embedding function with respect to the loss function of how accurate our predictions are on the test set. Um, although note here that I'm abusing notation a bit in that the kind of this, this loss function would be something like cross entropy, for example, and would use the predicted distribution over test labels rather than only the, uh, only the output, the, the max label. Okay, so any questions on how you would go about training matching networks? Okay, so now one thing that we might think about is, well, if we're doing one-shot classification where we have one example per class, this is pretty uh, straightforward uh, because we're gonna be making basically, uh, we're gonna be making, uh, making comparisons to each of those classes but what if we're in the case where we have more than one shot? Um, if we have more than one data point per class, then what Matching Networks is gonna do is gonna be performing these comparisons independently. And so if we have, uh, if we're doing dogs versus cats, for example, and we have two dogs and two cats, it's just gonna find the closest image and output the label corresponding to that, um, or, or basically do a weighted average of those, and look at the two dogs independently and look at the two cats independently in our training data set. And so, one thing we might think about is, well, maybe it makes sense to think about a more aggregated, like to, to aggregate information per class in a way that is smarter than just performing these independent comparisons. Uh, and that's what uh, prototypical networks do. So they think about how can we aggregate class information to create a prototypical embedding of that class and then perform comparisons to each of those prototypical, cl prototypical class embeddings in order to predict the label corresponding to our test image. Okay, so what this more concretely looks like is we'll have a number of images for different classes. So here different colors correspond to different image classes in our training data set for a particular task. And then we embed those, each of our training images into this embedding space and then take the average in this embedding space in order to compute the prototypical embedding for class one, class two, and class three. And then we embed our test image into this same space, same exact space and compute uh, the distance to each of those prototypical class embeddings. Uh, and then we can output the one, output the class for which it is closest to in this embedding space. So what this looks like in equations is we'll uh, embed our, um, each of our images in, for a particular class uh, into this embedding space and then take the average for each of uh, for each of those images uh, to compute this prototypical embedding CK for class K. And then to compute which class, to compute the class of our test data point, we will take the distance between the embedded test data point and each of those classes and perform a softmax over each of those, um, each of those uh, negative distances in order to compute the probability for the test data point. 
Um, and then in this case, D can correspond to Euclidean distance or cosine distance, some kind of your favorite diff distance metric uh, in this, but computed in this learned embedding space. Okay, so this is an algorithm that uh, you'll be implementing in homework two. Are there any questions on how it works? Okay. Cool. So this is prototypical networks. Um, basically, what it corresponds to, uh, I guess, basically what, what many of these approaches correspond to is basically embed your data points and then do nearest neighbors in that learned embedding space. Now, one challenge that might come up is, well, what if you want to do reason about more complex relationships between data points rather than just doing nearest neighbors in your embedding space? Um, in principle, if you have an expressive enough encoder uh, in your embedding space, the nearest neighbors should be able to represent a wide range of complex relationships, uh, particularly for high dimensional embedding spaces. Uh, but in practice, people have found it to be useful to think about more expressive ways to perform these types of comparisons. So for example, um, relation networks basically takes prototypical networks and learns a nonlinear relation module on top of those embeddings. This basically just corresponds to learning that function D in prototypical networks instead of using a Euclidean distance metric or a cosine distance metric. So it's learning both the embedding and the distance metric. Uh, another approach is to, instead of having a single prototype per, um, per class, have a mixture of prototypes per class. And this allows you to, for example, represent um, more multimodal class distributions. So maybe one class, um, Maybe if you have kind of the class dog, maybe uh, dogs are often either seen on snow or on grass, and you want to be able to represent both of those, uh, both of those kind of modes of your class in your embedding space. It may be easier to try to allow your embedding space to have a multimodal distribution rather than trying to kind of change your embedding space in a way that puts them all in the same part of the embedding space. Uh, and then lastly, uh, another paper has looked at, can we embed, uh, perform, and embedding on all of our data points and then do some sort of message passing scheme in order to think about how these different uh, data points relate to each other and in order to make the predicted output. Uh, and what this does is it uses graph neural networks in order to perform this message passing and differentiate through it. Okay, um, so now that's kind of mostly it for non-parametric methods. Uh, they're, they're quite simple and We'll talk a bit about some of the takeaways of these methods uh, in kind of the last part of this lecture where we talk about how we can think about comparing these approaches. Okay, um, and so I guess as a more meta point, uh, we have all these algorithms or really these kind of three classes of approaches that we've talked about, black box adaptation, optimization based approaches, and non-parametric approaches. Uh, and so how should we think about how these different methods compare? Uh, I think that there are a few different ways to think about this and so I'll present two different ways uh, to think about this. Uh, and the first is to think about the kind of computation graph perspective. How do these different algorithms look like as different computation graphs? And we, we visited, we kind of talked about this viewpoint earlier um, where the black box approaches are representing this computation graph in a completely back black box approach, whereas optimization based approaches, you can view them as embedding an optimization into your computation graph. Uh, and for non-parametric approaches, you can also take this view. And in particular, what the computation graph will look like uh, for prototypical net networks, for example, is something that uh, for your test data point uh, embeds it and compares it to each of your per class prototypes, where those per task prototypes are computed um, using the embedding of each of, those, uh, each of those classes' data points. So you can essentially just view it as another kind of computation graph where we're embedding the soft nearest neighbors into the computation graph. Okay, so with this view, um, we can also think about how we can mix and match components of the computation graph uh, to get hybrid types of approaches. Yeah. Yeah, so you can essentially view all of these methods as a computation graph. And whether or not that, like, the, 
optimization-based methods and non-parametric methods are essentially imposing a certain type of structure inside your computation graph that corresponds to things like gradient descent and nearest neighbors, uh, whereas black box methods tend to not impose any structure on that process. Um, there is a bit of a gray line between like what, what computation graphs look more like non-parametric methods versus what computation graphs look more like black box methods. Um, I think it's helpful to think about this, this kind of different classification of methods because it allows us to think about the certain properties of these, these methods, although in practice, um, there isn't a very clear cut line between them. Yeah? Uh, in the definition of CK, the summation, is it over XY such that Y equals CK? Yeah, that's a good point. So it should be over XY such that Y equals K. Yeah, exactly. And I'll try to fix that. I noticed that on the previous slide, and I'll try to fix that on the, um, before we post the slides online. Okay. Is there a question in the back? Okay, so um, we can again, because we can think of these as computation graphs, it also is pretty easy to think about how we might try to mix and match components of these. So um, one approach, which is a bit of a hybrid of black box approaches and optimization-based approaches, or, or maybe optimization-based and non-parametric, depending on the way you view things, um, is an approach that tries to condition a model on an embedding of the data set, uh, of your training data set, uh, and also run gradient descent on that model. Uh, in practice, this sort of the, these sources of information by conditioning on the data with a direct way as well as through gradient descent could potentially be redundant. Um, although in practice, it seems like this method found some benefit in doing that. Uh, another idea here that you could do is have some sort of embedding of your function and then do gradient descent on that embedding space. Uh, and so particularly, they have uh, this paper uses a relation network to embed your training data set and think about how different data points relate to one another. Uh, and then they decode this embedding into the parameters of a neural network that makes predictions about new data points. Uh, and then instead of running gradient descent on the parameters of that function, they run gradient descent in the learned embedding space Z, uh, which produces uh, different functions. So you, this, you can essentially view it as running gradient descent on a lower dimensional space of your weights, rather than ru running gradient descent in the original space of your weights. Okay, and then the last uh, approach that I'll cover is that uh, there's also an approach that looked at doing something exactly like MAML, but initializing the last layer of the network to correspond to prototypical networks. Um, so it's a pretty, basically a specific form of a particular choice of the network architecture for MAML that initializes it to do something like a comparison-based um, comparison prediction. Okay. So that's the kind of computation graph view is one way to think about how these different algorithms compare. And the other way that I like to think about how these algorithms compare is to think about the different properties of the individual algorithms. Um, and in particular, I think there are two properties that are really important as we start to think about developing meta-learning algorithms and developing new meta-learning algorithms. Um, the first is thinking about expressive power of these algorithms. So we talked about this a bit before, is basically the, the ability for that function f that I showed on the previous <coughs> slide to represent a range of learning procedures as a function of, um, as a function of your training data set. Uh, and the reason why this is important is that it means that as you get more larger and larger meta-training data sets, you'll be able to produce a more flexible range of learned optimizers. And as you apply these types of algorithms to more challenging optimization problems, you'll be able to do better than the kind of the standard optimization procedures we have today. Um, so it essentially has to do with scalability and where these methods will end up in the future. Uh, if you can only represent a small class of algorithms, then you're you may not be as effective when moving towards broader meta-training data sets. Okay, so this is the first property. And the second property, which I alluded to very briefly before, is the property of consistency. Uh, and in particular, what I mean by consistency is that the meta-learning algorithm will produce a learned learning procedure that will solve the task with enough data, regardless of the properties of that task. It will essentially produce a consistent learning procedure such that given enough data, I guess what I mean by a consistent learning procedure is one that will kind of asymptotically solve the task given enough data at that task. 
And so for example, things like gradient descent correspond to a consistent learning procedure because you're just running gradient descent at test time and you can expect uh, at the end of given enough data for that test task, you'll be able to solve the task regardless of what your meta training data was. Now, why is, why is this important? Well, first, uh, getting meta training data that corresponds, I'll, I'll get to your question in a second. First, getting meta training data that corresponds closely to what you'll be seeing at test time is pretty hard. So we, we haven't really talked about this much, but we're, we've been assuming that we have this meta training data set and we can use this meta training data set in a set of tasks in order to do well at new tasks. Uh, but in practice, how do we determine what those tasks actually correspond to? This is actually a really hard problem as we think about where we're going to be applying these algorithms. Uh, and so if we produce a consistent learning procedure, then we can expect it to do something reasonable on tasks that aren't necessarily uh, especially close to the meta training tasks that we trained it on. Uh, and we can also get basically get better out of distribution task performance. There's a question. Even without meta learning or anything, there's never any guarantee that doing gradient descent will lead to any progress. But even more so in this case, which is kind of like restricting, well, like initializing the network in a way could lead to never getting like a good enough loss reduction or anything. Right? Yeah. So the I guess the, the question was about um, like can't we have a catastrophic initialization such that gradient descent doesn't actually give us a good solution? Um, and I guess the short answer is yes. Uh, I guess one thing we can assume with gradient descent is that we'll at least get to a local optimum. Um, whether that local optimum is good or not is a kind of another question. And it could be that our, we could have an initialization that puts us in a place that the local optimum is actually very bad uh, for that particular basin. Um, the, so absolutely, uh, that's, and that's something I think that people haven't thought about quite as much yet. Uh, and so thinking about how we might um, how, how we might try to tackle that sort of problem, and does that actually happen in practice? Does we, do we actually get to local optimum that are bad? Is kind of another question. Um, the Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so there are other ways to try to think about how you might formalize this problem as well. Um, and something like basically monotonic improvement could be one of them as well. Uh, yeah. And I guess theoretically thinking about that sort of problem may also draw very closely to some of the theoretical questions in deep learning in general, like are local optimum good uh, with high probability, things like that. And people have started, people have looked at that sort of problem in the past. Okay, um, and I guess one thing I was gonna mention here is that we recall that this, in practice, things like gradient descent, if we're running that at test time, do tend to empirically actually hold up with regard to getting better out of distribution task performance in comparison to black box adaptation approaches. Okay, um, and so in my mind, these are the kind of the two properties that are most important for many different applications of meta-learning, uh, not necessarily the benchmarks that we have, because the benchmarks are well-defining a nice set of meta-training tasks and a set of meta-test -task tasks that kind of closely align with that. But in practice, if we're thinking about applying these algorithms on real problems, <coughs> these are the two properties that I think that we're gonna care about the most. Okay, um, and so let's think about how, these, how the different algorithms compare on these different axes. So for black box approaches, we know that they have complete expressive power. Uh, in the respect that things like recurrent neural networks are universal function approximators. Uh, and we also know that they're not consistent and that they won't, uh, if you aren't imposing any structure on the function, uh, on your black box function, then they will, there's no guarantees that they'll produce anything that is consistent. Okay, um, for optimization based methods, we know that uh, it reduces to gradient descent, uh, at least for things like MAML. Uh, and so in that sense, they're consistent it, for some definition of consistent with regard to things like monotonic improvement. Um, and we also know that they are expressive if you have uh, deep enough models. Um, and in practice, we found these methods to perform 
uh, well on, on, on settings where you do want to be fairly expressive with regard to few shot learning algorithms. Uh, I put an asterisk here because this actually doesn't hold up in some reinforcement learning settings, and we'll potentially talk about this a bit later in the course. It mostly holds in supervised learning settings. Uh, it also depends on the particular reinforcement learning algorithm that you use, so it's a bit of a nuanced, uh, a nuanced thing that we'll discuss later. Uh, and then with regard to non-parametric approaches, uh, these methods are expressive for most architecture choices. Uh, for example, if you're using things like LSTMs, then there are a wide range of, of functions that you can represent. Uh, although there's a, a bit of nuance uh, depending on the types of learning algorithms that you might want to learn. Uh, and then they're also consistent under certain conditions. Uh, so they are consistent in the sense that if your embedding um, is not losing information that is uh, losing information about the inputs that is not, uh, that, that's important for making decisions, then uh, as you accumulate more and more data, uh, you'll eventually get something, a, a, kind of asymptotically, you'll eventually get to a data point that's arbitrarily close to your test data point and then be able to make um, the correct prediction for that test data point. Okay. Um, so beyond these, beyond these properties, there's also other properties that are pretty important for thinking about with regard to different applications. Um, so things like uh, being really easy to combine to a, with a variety of learning problems. Uh, this is true for black box approaches because it's, it's really easy to basically just plug in your uh, pl plug in different loss functions or different optimization procedures into these types of architectures. Um, the downsides, as I mentioned uh, last time, is that uh, it does involve a challenging optimization in that there's no in good inductive bias at initialization to point it in the direction of a, a real optimization procedure. And as a result, they're often fairly data inefficient because you have to learn how to learn completely from scratch. Okay, um, with regard to optimization-based methods, as we talked about earlier, we have this positive inductive bias at the start of meta-learning because we're initializing it with a, a real uh, optimization algorithm. Um, it can handle, I guess one thing I didn't mention before is it can handle varying K and large K uh, relatively well. If you have more data than what you trained on, for example, um, these approaches still tend to work well because they're consistent. Uh, and they're also model agnostic in the sense that you can kind of plug in different architectures and apply them uh, with, with conceptually with, without any difficulty. The downsides, as I mentioned before, you know, we have a second order optimization and it's usually compute intensive and memory intensive. Uh, and these two, these two points are quite important for a range of applications where you care a lot about compute uh, and memory, particularly when you're scaling to large data sets. Okay, and then with regard to non-parametric methods, uh, we didn't cover the pros and cons of this yet, other than these two. So the first is that one of the nice things about these methods is that they're entirely feed-forward architectures. They don't involve any, any back propagation within that computation graph. And so as a result, they tend to be very computationally fast, and tend, they tend to be very easy to optimize in contrast to architectures that involve recurrence, that involve uh, gradients pushing backwards, et cetera. Um, and then some of the downsides of these approaches is that uh, they're hard to generalize to varying K. This is more of a, a empirical observation that people have found is if you test them on more K than what they're trained on, they tend to underperform what, what uh, other algorithms are able to achieve. Uh, it's also hard to scale these to very large data sets uh, at test time because they're using non-parametric approaches. And so far these methods have also been limited to classification. Uh, in principle, you could also apply them to things like regression, but the, with the caveat that you could only interpolate between the labels, if you kind of, um, if, you, if you naively apply these approaches to regression, you can only interpolate between the labels that you saw in your, um, in your task specific training set, because you're just doing a weighted average of those labels at test time. Okay. And then at a more high level, it's worth mentioning that generally well-tuned versions of each of these algorithms tend to perform comparably on existing few shot benchmarks. And as I alluded to before, things, uh, various bells and whistles like using ensembles or using or tuning the architecture can lead to, um, are, are often the kind of the differentiating factor between these methods rather than the actual underlying method itself. Um, this likely says more about the benchmarks than about the approaches themselves. 
Uh, and I think that basically in, in many cases, which method you want to use will depend heavily on your use case and whether or not you care about things like consistency, whether or not you care about expressive power, whether or not you care about computational efficiency, uh, et cetera. Okay, any more questions on these, kind of how these algorithms compare and when you might use one versus the other? Okay, so I guess that's mostly it the, um, for today. So kind of to, to recap, we talked about uh, two algorithmic properties. We also talked about a computation graph perspective. Uh, one third property that's useful to think about is thinking about uncertainty awareness. Uh, by this I mean kind of the ability to reason about ambiguity during the learning process at test time. Uh, and the reason why this is important is that if you want to do things like active learning or have calibrated uncertainty estimates when you're learning from small amounts of data, or if you're in reinforcement learning settings and you want to reason about what data you should collect in order to, re to re reduce your uncertainty about the task, then you need to have some notion of, of your uncertainty. Uh, and uncertainty comes up especially in few shot learning problems where you only have a small amount of data and your prior can't necessarily make up for uh, what the true task is. Um, and the kind of the other kind of place where this comes in is that we talked about this really nice Bayesian motivation at the beginning of the course in the uh, in the second lecture in the third le second to third lecture, and uh, we've kind of moved to be moved to fully deterministic approaches. And in the next lecture, we'll talk about um, basically more principled Bayesian approaches that get back to that initial motivation and also give us things like calibrated uncertainty or more calibrated uncertainty and approaches that allow us to think about how we could collect more data to reduce our uncertainty. Uh, and we'll discuss all of those things on Monday. Um, on Wednesday, we have uh, student presentations again uh, that will be covering various, um, various algorithms and extensions of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, and then a few more reminders again, homework one is due on Wednesday. Please fill out the poster uh, presentation preferences for the dates. Uh, we need to know kind of when you're available and the information about the course product is online. I'll see you on Wednesday.